Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I am so happy today because I personally gonna be educated about a lot of stuff from the decentralized social media and you know Web three and a lot of stuff because I have Justin Rizvani in the studio. He's a is a founder of Zion and you know he was actually working the Amplify that he exit successfully and started a Zion. And he's not only entrepreneur, he's a marketer, advertiser, coach, speaker, author, as you see the book up here. You should actually read that book and buy it. It's very fascinating. And you understand the, you understand the meaning of freedom. <laughs> That's me. That's what I learned. But Justin, thank you so much for being here, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. I really, really, really appreciated it. While I was reading the book, I told you that I didn't know anything about, you know, we know the definition of freedom. We all want to be freedom, but free, but in technology aspects of freedom, it can be very complicated. Absolutely. Yeah, where, where you came from, just tell us a little bit background about yourself, who you are, because you started to amplify the most important part with no bootstrapping. Yeah. yeah Dear yeah. Lord. Yeah. When I read that, I said, he's my hero. Yeah, it was, it was actually a very, I was 24. It was a very fun experience because I launched the business and then in six weeks we had 110,000 in revenue. Wow. And... 60,000 in profit. So the context for me as an entrepreneur is that within the first six weeks of starting that company, I had made more money than the last two years. Actually, I made more money than I'd ever made in my life. And so that was the, the click for me to say, okay, let me lean into this. Um, we did 1.5 the first year, 3.5 the second year, and we wow. did almost 3.5 in profit the third year. So it was like, it was just a very fast growing business. I was very blessed to be in that category, which yeah. is early, very early, early. You know, early. bootstrapping is, so what did you decide that you, you don't want to bootstrap? What was it? Did you? Know? I just had no, I didn't understand. I didn't understand anything otherwise. Like I, I don't, <laughs> I like, I didn't understand the concept of like starting a business with other people's money. It didn't really make sense to me. It's like, wait, so the point of a business is to make more money than you spend. And you only have a short duration time window to make that happen. If it doesn't work in that short duration, your business doesn't work. That's the only way I understand how to do business. So there wasn't like a... That's a great way. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, and I I do have to give credit to like my parents because my parents were like very supportive early on and said, hey, like, we'll give you a couple months to do this. Like, if you can do it, great. And if not, whatever, we tried. And so the thing is, it worked. And that was the the blessing that kind of resulted. Because before the Amplify, you were working with Disney, is that right? Yeah, so my first job internship, I was still in college, was at the Walt Disney Company. I was the mobile marketing intern, and I was my third year in school. And then I worked at a banner ad company for a few months and like learning about advertising. But I generally am unemployable. Like I have never been employable in the sense of like to work for somebody has never been part of my DNA. I'm kind of a self-starter, want to build my own thing. And I have my own ideas. And so like people that have ideas don't work well in large corporations. That's just not how it like you just if you have ideas, you don't go work for big companies. You go do it yourself. And that was just what I always, always was inept to do. It always felt right. And you know, a lot of people actually, I'm so happy you mentioned that, but a lot of people, they make that mistake that they say that, you know, I want to go work for these companies, but they are actually not in them. And then they fail and then get discouraged. Mm. And then they said, oh, I shouldn't do that. But before, you know, you said Walt Disney because Walt Disney's got an amazing culture, the Walt Disney way, you know, the Disney way. I took the courses once. Mm. It was great. You had some experience when you started Amplify? You just said, I want to do this. No, I just had, like, experience, it's relative, right? Like, who has an experience running a large ad business at 24? I mean, nobody. Like, like it, it's it was scary. figuring it out. Like, experience, maybe, but how much experience can you have at 24? Not a lot, right? Like, the experience for me was just, like, throwing myself in the fire. Like, balance a P&L quickly, understand how to gain customers, understand how to bring sales in, understand how to collect the revenue, understand how to pay all the people that are around you. It's just, I was thrown into the fire very early, but I was also blessed to be the son of an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur our whole, my whole life. So I understood those aspects of business very early on, very blessed for my father to be able to instill those values in me. But I learned from just doing. I, it wasn't like I went to business school or like, because I don't think anyone teaches you how to be an entrepreneur. It's either something that's in you or it's not. It's very simple. It's very binary in some but ways. But these days you, you hear this a lot, I'm sure, amongst your friends and the colleagues. 
everybody wants to be an entrepreneur these days. I don't know what it is. Yeah, they want to be, but I'm not sure that that's the most effective way society should run. It's not, that's not how everyone, can, like not everyone can be an entrepreneur. It's either something you're built in and something that you're not. That's why I think 95% fail in the first three years, just because Amber Alert. <laughs> Amber um, Alert. Yeah, I turn off, I always turn that stuff off. Yeah. Um, I think that not everyone is built to do that generally. I just don't think that they're built to be an entrepreneur. And so um, I think the motivation is maybe a lot of people are built to be number twos, but the fire that's required to run your own business, I think most people aren't really ready for that. And, and, and I say this a lot is that, in fact, it could be more of a disservice to your career if you decide to do an entrepreneurial mm. journey, fail miserably. And if you don't know how to bounce back from that, it can be really bad for you for the rest of the time. So maybe the decision is not to do that. What, what a lot of great entrepreneurs need, I need this, is like a great number two, three, and four. Maybe, you're, maybe your role is to be very supportive to a founder or an entrepreneur, and that's the way that you drive to success. And I think people are not, like, I think we need to make those number twos and number threes and number fours a lot more sexy in society instead of thinking that entrepreneurship is the only way. Because what people don't tell you is the nights that you don't sleep, the nights that you're up at 5 a.m. every day, the nights that you're thinking about your business 24-7, and everyone around you relies on your thinking, and you're holding that container deeply. That's a very hard role to, to be, and most people just don't have that to hold. But maybe they can be that support role for the person that has to hold it. You don't you think that they don't want to be vulnerable? Because I always talk about vulnerability. I know a lot of people that they don't want to be vulnerable or... They don't say that. I need a number two. Like me personally, I don't like to deal with financial. I can read p and I can do chart of account. I don't want it. That's not me. I'm a connector. I go out there. I make the rain. I want somebody else to deal with the mud. That's mm. me. But you have to find that. But I am vulnerable. I have a coach. And I told him I show my vulnerability. Because unfortunately, I think some entrepreneurs, they think the vulnerability is a sign of weakness, mm. as you said. Do, do you think it's really a sign of weakness? Because I'm a, sure you ask for help. I think it's a superpower. I think, That's I, think, what I, think, I think being truly vulnerable is a superpower. And I think as I'm getting older, I'm realizing that it, it, it's kind of a, also it's like a double-edged sword. Yes. It's, it's like um, people can also use vulnerability against you. So it's something that can be used as a superpower, but you have to be very aware of it and how it's being used. And how you can use it and just say, look, I'm who not... Who you share it with? Uh, not necessarily not who you share it with. I think it's also like know your strengths and weaknesses. Know that you're not perfect. Find the ways you can fill those gaps. But vulnerability is, is beautiful in some ways, I think, because it allows you to bring a more human side. It's not just like that you're this robot and operator that excels at this highest level. Is that like you're a person made of flesh and bones and you have things that you have to kind of work through. And, and I think vulnerability is actually a, a superpower for an entrepreneur. You know, I, I was reading about you and I you know, look at your LinkedIn post and everything else. Beside being a tech, you know, wizard or, you know, <laughs> I don't like think that. Thank but you, very kind. You, you have a very soft heart for people and... People comes first, I think, in your journey. Yeah, you of think about people, talk about people, you care about feelings, you care about a lot of stuff. Why, why you do that? Why, why people come first for you? I think because it's the only thing we're really here to do. I think that, like, ultimately, you can make all the money in the world, but if you end up having terrible relationships in your life, if you end up being a bad son or you end up being a bad father or a bad mother or you're like you're a bad friend to people people are not going to remember how much money you made people are not going to rem remember your PL. people are not going to remember your exit people are not going to remember your stock price the only people are going to remember is how you made them feel and ultimately wow. you have to remember that like how you make someone feel is ultimately your responsibility in the world and you know it's 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 the reflection of you as a person i uh, a friend of mine passed away a few months ago and, you know, I was reflecting on his life and a lot of us were reflecting on his life and it's like, he wasn't known for being this incredible entrepreneur. He wasn't running a massive business, but everyone remembered that he was the kindest person that they have ever met. And that's a memory and a story that someone will ever see. 
And the stories of how we portray ourselves in this society is the only thing that lives a legacy. Um, I'll tell a quick thing about stories. So, you know the story of King Arthur? Yeah. Um, so in the, the whole parable, King Arthur actually gets defeated. Um, he gets defeated by the dark side and the dark side takes over the kingdom and that ends up who wins the battle. But do you ever hear about the one that actually won the battle? No, you only hear the stories of King Arthur. So it's all about the stories in our lives and the way that we show up and how we make people feel that will eventually leave our legacy, not the eventual outcome. Do you think the legacy is today or what we leave behind? I think it's absolutely how you live your life while you're alive. Because ultimately, yes, your life can live on in the back end and things that you do can live on in the back end. But ultimately, it, it truly is a relationship first world. And it's hard to deal with relationships because we come from our parents or whatever with a lot of stuff. Like sometimes like relationships are a very hard thing to manage. So that's been my big thing that I'm trying to figure out right now in my career is like, how am I better at managing relationships? Like I know myself as an entrepreneur, like I'm not a great manager. I'm not the perfect manager. I, I don't, I, I have so many things that I need to improve in that area to take my business to the next level. And the interpersonal skills are the things that I'm lacking the most. So it's the thing I'm leaning into the most as an operator. I have ideas, I have ways to scale, I have execution, I have concepts, I have my way of building products. But the people part is, is the hardest thing I think about building a business. Yeah, but you know, as Marcus Lemonis always says, I, I like the guy, he always says, you know, the people process product, which is you got the product, you got the process, but the people are the biggest assets of any organizations. Like they can make you or break you. And I think that part is very important that as you see right now, how many layoffs have you heard? Yeah, a thousand, ten hundred thousand. And how many thousand? Tech, in, in and tech. I, I know that they got to do what they got to do. But at the end, I think it, the reason that you and I, we can't work for the companies, I think, they look at the people as a numbers. They no, they not look at the people as a people. Yeah, ultimately in these much larger organizations, absolutely. Because you know, like they're managing billions in a PL. Yeah, and that's sometimes hurtful. But going back to the people, I know you you built it, you founded a Xeon, and is that company is it works around people a lot. Yeah. Like what is that's what I'm very fascinated by telling us what is the Xeon, how you build that, because it's all centralized around the people and protect them and make them free and decentralize things. And this decentralization of the technology, I really sometimes cannot grasp it. It's very complex things right now. Really complicated. It's very complicated. That's what I have a lot of questions for you that just... Tell us how you started the Xeon and what is the whole concept? So had my exit in 2016, took a couple, you know, was on the board till 2018 and then took about two years off. And 2020, when I moved to Austin, I was introduced to some folks that had a lot of their content being censored on the internet. So the question I was asking myself, I was like, is there a product on, on the web that could build a truly censorship resistant system. And then I took a step back to understand, well, what are the concepts that allow for decentralization on the web? And I started and kind of started backwards. There's, there's three things to think about in any application framework that allows you to actually send a message to another person. Number one is the identity of the user. So the question is, who is sending and who is receiving? So it's the, the base layer of who we are. Um, on the internet. Most of the identity services that run on the internet are highly centralized. For example, 1.5 billion people in the world use Gmail at Gmail to log into everything. They pretty much use it to log into their bank account. Yeah. That is their identity on the web. That's controlled by Google, right? So if Google decides that your Gmail is no longer allowed... And you then, then you lose all the downstream services that your original identity was tied to. That 
yeah. email address. So most people at the base layer don't own their digital identity. Then the next question is, how do messages move between two individuals? Um, usually if they run through email, maybe there's all these email servers. If you're on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, any of those applications, you're running through a centralized server, a centralized broker that allows the message to go through. And then the final piece is the compensation element. Okay, so if you want to get paid for something, what are the services that allow a payment to move between two individuals? And if you look at most of the services on the web, again, highly centralized. So you need a trusted third party to actually make a payment go through. So at, at, when you explore payments, messaging, and identity, you realize that everything is highly centralized. So if you want to build a new type of system, you have to build it from the ground up and think about these three types of things. So Zion was originally created to solve for those three problems, saying, okay, can we give an individual their own identity back and let them to be the only one that controls their identity? And we use a, a spec called a DID, a decentralized identity. And what's unique about it is that when you create it on your phone, if you go to the Zion app and you go to create account, what happens is that we give you a 12-word seed phrase on the device. We don't actually give it to you, though. The device is giving it to you. And what happens is that allows you now to have a secret key that is the login for your identity. And then we take that basically piece of code and we write it to a blockchain. We write it to Bitcoin's blockchain in particular. So now, instead of your identity living on Google server, it now lives on the most immutable database ever created, replicated across thousands of machines across the world. And you are the only one that has access to it. Wow. I cannot delete your identity because now it's living on Bitcoin's blockchain. And what's cool about it is, well, how do we know this is true? Well, the way you know it's true is you go into the app, you click decentralized identity, you will see the DID, which is this really long string that's a, that you have full control over, and you can click this thing that says Open Explorer and actually find your identity on the Bitcoin blockchain and confirm that what you're seeing on your phone is actually living on that blockchain. And I think that's what's unique about that to me is that there is no central authority that decides who you are or decides can you be on this service or can you not be on this service? And that's the beginning of building a decentralized web is the base layer of interoperable decentralized identity. And how that's going to help the, the censorship? So if a centralized authority cannot turn you off, then you still have a, an account to use and people can always reference that account. For example, if I know what your DID is and you now go to another service or you're going inside of this app and posting, oh, I know that that's Rami because that's his DID. I, as a CEO, I can't turn off that DID. And I think that's the important thing. It's not that if we won't censor you, is that I can't censor you. And that's the mind melt to think about of a, a decentralized open system. That's the first layer. Then we look about messaging. How, how do messages move? And the approach that we took was there's a, there's a spec called a decentralized web node. Um, this is not something we invented. It's something that's coming out of TBD and Block, Jack Dorsey's company. Yeah, Jack Dorsey. And we're using this way of like storing messages and sending messages using a decentralized web node. And then the final piece is money is that how do you transfer value between two individuals? Yeah. And that's where we're using Bitcoin. And, and I think that Bitcoin is the hardest money ever created when it comes to a decentralized cryptocurrency. And what's really cool is like it truly allows us to move a peer-to-peer -peer payment. Like one thing we could do is if I grab my phone and you open your Zion app and I can send you an invoice and you can see how fast this money moves. Like it's, it's truly an incredible peer-to-peer -peer network and seeing it in real time to me is a very cool kind of feature of the application. This is the future of payment technology, you think? I think so. I think, I think that Bitcoin as a base layer is definitely a future of a payment technology because it allows for efficiencies to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Like the, the thing is that our banking system is highly inefficient. We're seeing the impacts of fractional reserve banking we're seeing that most banks are actually insolvent, if you actually think about it, like, like what's actually happening underneath. And 
people need an alternative, and I think Bitcoin is a chance. Bitcoin does have an opportunity. And how Zion is going to help the pro, uh, the, the <clears throat> privacy? Well, because you have your decentralized identity is owned by yourself. Um, we can't turn you off, and every message that's sent inside the network is encrypted. So even though that Zion hosts its own DWNs, we don't have access to what the messages actually are. Um, it's not publicly available on any blockchain to see what the messages are going back and forth. So there's no way for me to actually look at the things that are being sent onto that network. Basically, if I have a Xeon app and XYZ person's got a Xeon app, we can send messages back and forth. Absolutely. And, that, and the point wow. is that it's being encrypted on the devices and it's also being signed cryptographically by your DID every time a message is sent. So we want to kind of be... It, I, we don't want to be in control. Like I, I have no interest in knowing people's data. I have no interest. Like I don't want any liability of that information. So that's why we're kind of like offloading some of these other things. But that's why it's also more complicated to get on Zion, right? Like it's not an easy app to log into the first time. You're like, wait, what is this? Twelve words. Like I have to write these words down and make sure. I, and if I lose them, <laughs> I lose my account. That's crazy. Like, well, it is. It, it is a little bit crazy. But if it wasn't that way then we would have access. And the point is, we don't have access. Like that, that actual user interface proves that Zion doesn't have access to the private keys. They don't have access to that information. They don't have access to that identity. And we can never have access to it. Basically, you're not monetizing anything. We are monet. Yes, we are. Like, for example, the way that we monetize in-app is that if you want to have your own decentralized web node, and you don't want to host it yourself, and you want to build a community on the app, that's where we make, that's our revenue model, is that you can create a community on there, You can so you can have a chat room, you can have all messages and all the things that you want, and then you pay us a fee per month to host that for you. That's great. For example, if, for Talk to Rami, if I want to have my community, and for all my listeners, my viewers. Exactly. I got it. And now it's, and it's a chat room. It's like, a, like we clone Telegram effectively. But what's cool about it is we've cloned Telegram but added tipping inside the content. So you can now send each other Satoshis, which is like small Bitcoin, to each other for posts and for content. Like pay for memes effectively. That's, that's the amazing. You know, it gets very complicated for the ordinary people if they don't understand it. But as you explain it, I kind of get it. Yeah. You know, and it's, it, is, it is quite cool when you see a payment move between two people. Like it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Like I've been doing, so sometimes I do these Zoom meetings with people and I, um, we have a friend that lives in another country and like in the Zoom meeting, he, he went on the Zion app, he said, request 2,500 Satoshis with like 42 cents and put the QR code up to the screen. I was on my screen, I scanned it and it was there under a second. I'm moving money across the world instantly. Without any third party in middle. Exactly. Wow. That's, to me, that's like, that's a big change. Yeah, it's, it's gangster. It's like it's cool. really, it's really big change. <laughs> and how does this is going to affect social media? I know you heard about like, you know, TikTok right now, we're going to ban it, we're going to do this, the privacy and everything else. It's really getting a, I'm sorry, but it's a shit show right now. It's quite. It's actually very dangerous. Um, what's happening with this TikTok ban? Um, act for me, it's very dangerous because if you actually read this act, which is called the Restrict Act, um, it's actually not just a ban on TikTok. It's effectively giving government root access to any application that has over a million people using it. This is un unprecedented privacy concerns for any individual. And what I mean by root access is saying that the CIA and the Department of Commerce would have a direct connection to your server to read every single thing that's going on inside of that network. We, as a company, don't even have that information ourselves. So it puts us in a bit of a conundrum, right? Another part of this TikTok law was saying that if you use a VPN, you could have up to 20 years in prison what? As a part of using, this is not, Joe Georgetson, which is a presidential candidate, put that on her Twitter. This, this is not, this is worse than the Patriot Act that happened in 2001. This is not just a ban on TikTok. It's one of the worst things that could happen to Americans across the and world. And you know, Facebook, they use our, our data. Of course they do. And why are they not doing it for Facebook? They would do it for Facebook. But I think that, the, I personally think they are, the government already has root access to Facebook. 
Like any, any, any platform that government has root access to, thumbs up. This makes it a law. And this makes the, the, the Secretary of Commerce, an unelected official, unilateral power over that information. But this is not a freedom. Of course it's not. This, this act could be one of the worst things for American privacy and for Americans across the world if it passes. And they're, they're making it seem as if it's just a ban on TikTok, but it's in fact not just that. And that was what really, really surprised me over this last week was like reading it more, unpacking it, the impacts that it's going to do for individuals across this world is you know, we, we basically start losing our freedom slower and slower. And it's not about TikTok. Do it's about control. Do you think the ban is going to go through? I hope that the Restrict Act does not go through. And I think if you have an opportunity to call a senator or a congressman and say, like, listen, this is overreaching a little bit too much. An unelected official has unilateral power over citizens. And that should never happen. And that gets me to this, that I ask you, what is then your definition of freedom? Well, what is my definition of freedom? <laughs> it's just... It's a good question. Yeah, it's just... I, I don't... I got to think about that. Um, I think the first thing that comes to light about what is the definition of freedom is that an individual has true property rights. And we and don't sometimes. I, I think in most ways we don't. I think in most ways in this country, um, true property rights, which was um, effectively what the founding fathers derived this country about, which was having, you know, the ability and authority to have property rights, slowly gets diminished over time. We learned over the COVID pandemic that, you know, the property rights of your own body can be taken away. And you have to kind of be at cause of like, you know what, we're all doing this, so we should all do this. And slowly but surely, freedoms get slowly, slowly, slowly taken away until there are none. And I think this, this Restrict Act is an, is an amazing example of, you know, the facade is that we're banning TikTok because government has root access, because China has root access, but it's not really what they want to do. Do you really think China has a root access? Probably. They, but they probably have for four years. This is not. This is. This exactly. is not, This is not new information. This is the thing. Like they oh, knew all, it. Like all of a sudden now it's a big deal. Like why is it now a big deal? Like what? What is it about this time that we have to now talk about TikTok today? This has been happening for years. Why is it now aware? Like, and I think when you read the Restrict Act, you realize that okay, here's the plan, guys. We're going to ban this app. We're going to say it's because of China, but actually what we're doing is right here. This is actually what we're doing because we want to be able to survey every single thing that happens to every American and make it legally unilaterally. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put into law that companies have to abide by the federal government into any communication platform. It is a direct attack on free speech and open networks. Yeah, if, if I want to use any platform, like not even TikTok, anything else, and the government has a direct root access and that's not my freedom and you know it's just I of don't course not that. of course not you know, that, and, they're, and they're trying to put that into law and that's worse yeah it's really bad like it's gonna it's, really it's really scary and we don't know really what's gonna happen with the, this all social engagement between people or communities like mine or yours or anybody else of course how we're gonna how we're gonna handle that or what would the future especially when now they are scared of AI hmm and that's another story, like I just heard today that AI is going to destroy the humanity. <laughs> you believe that? I think that AGI is a little bit further away to destroying society, but is there a scenario, you know, ChatGPT already can write code. Which GPT-4 can write code? The question is, when do we get to a point where that it's writing its own code, improving itself, updating itself, and then seeing that as a Moore's Law exponential curve of it training itself, replicating itself, and doing what it wants to do on servers across the world. Um, I don't know if that's five years away, it's 10 years away, but it's very clear that that is an eventual outcome of what's going on. I think right now it's an effective tool to help us do things. I use ChatGPT almost every day to write stuff. And I think it's interesting. It's like an interesting thought experiment that you have this like assistant that just has a lot more information than you do. But 
maybe that does impact our digital world in some way. But ultimately, like AI is never going to replace a human. AI is never going to replace the feeling of a brushstroke. Um, a friend of mine was telling a, a story last night. He's like, we were smoking a cigar, and an AI could never roll a cigar the way a human <laughs> hand has yeah. done for 50 years. That the, the, the touch, the feel, the way that every single piece of tobacco is rolled in that experience and then smoked, no AGI can ever replace the human hand of that experience. The As same no, thing with painting. Uh, exactly. Art, art can never be the same. You know, when you look at something, you're like, yeah, that, a computer created that, not a person. And then you look at something like that, it's like, oh, that's from a person. You can feel that energy. And, and so, yeah, maybe there's some things digitally that make us better and maybe improve it some efficiently, but it'll never replace humans. It's, as you said, it's going to be a tool. You know, I can give you a knife and you can cut the watermelon with it, or you can hurt somebody, be a weapon. Mm. It's up to us how we're going to use it. But a lot of creative writers, they, they are afraid that they're going to lose their job. And I told one of them, that creative mind, mm. I don't think so. The AI can replace that. Because I think, um, I think there was someone on Tim Ferriss's podcast who was like an AI experience. Like The reason AI can never replace humans is that, that it cannot say no. Humans are great because we know how to say no to things. We know how to be resistant. Our resistance builds our resilience. And so I think that's an interesting unlock is that it listens to whatever we say at this point. It can't say no yet. And it can never replace human. It, maybe it can at some other point in the future. But ultimately right now, it's all about how human emotion is played into these computers. But I know as we feed this system, it gets smarter. Sure, of course it does. I think, as you know, as a tech person, it gathers all the data, I think, and things and spread it you know, back or put it together. I don't know how it really works deeply, but it gets smarter. Like, it starts getting to know my habit of writing. And that's good, right? It's good. It's a, it's a good thing that maybe improves us and makes us a little bit, gives us a little bit of an edge. And the people that take advantage of that will build great businesses and create a lot of value. But I think the human thing is, is really what's, it's, yeah, it, I, I don't think it could ever replace that I think, human experience. I think, you know, going back with the human, everything that I'm reading recently or I'm studying or, or thinking is all revolves around humans. Sure. What we do. And I think that's, we are the big part of this equation because technologies keep going, going forward, and they're getting smarter. But at the end, I tell everybody that we are the one we created. We, mm. we make this happen. Yeah. You know, going back with the Facebook, with Instagram, whatever, with all this platform and Google, even the AI, we are the creators. And as we get smarter, they, got, they get smarter. Sure. I think what's important also is that, you know, what we're seeing with ChatGPT is that the price of content is almost effectively going down to zero. So there's two things that are really important in this new age. The question is, how do you prove that the person posting something is actually who they are? That's the first piece, yes. right? That's like the one thing. Like, How do you know this is actually a real person posting this, not, a, not an AI posting it? And then the question is, if the price of content effectively goes down to zero, how do you know content is valuable? So these are the two questions I ask myself a lot. So the two things that we applied as far as building Zion is number one. So we we talked about your identity um, at the beginning of like that's what the app does. It's an identity yes. app. Every message that you post from your device is cryptographically signed with your DID. So you know there's provenance that Rami actually posted this piece of content on his device, not some other computer from somebody else. It was cryptographically signed by your phone. And then because we have these elements of Satoshis that can actually boost content, and what I mean by boost content is like you can tip every piece of content in the app. You can give someone five sats for like, oh, that was a great comment. Thank you so much. There's no likes in the network because likes can be gamed by bots. You can't fake is physically you can't, you can't fake bitcoin i like you that. can't make up bitcoin they can't buy likes you, <laughs> you can't buy likes they like like because bitcoin <laughs> because what people don't understand about bitcoin 
is that they think Bitcoin is like a, it is a cryptocurrency, but they just think it's a digital object. But what Bitcoin really is, it's an effective way to move energy over space and time. The reason I say that, and this that's, is like, that, hey, that's, that's the, I never, I never thought about that or that's a, that's new way so, of looking at it. So let, let me explain yeah. why. Energy is a, is a infinite and finite resource in our reality. It's everything that we do. What I'm breathing out is energy. These lights are energy. Everything is energy. And what Bitcoin has done is, is digitize energy. And what I mean by moving over space and time is that energy is very hard to actually move over space and time. It's, it's, you know, these, this energy and these lights is coming out of a system that probably just burned some coal and is directly coming here. So it can move over space, but you can't use that energy and move it effectively over time. The way Bitcoin is created, every Bitcoin that's ever been created, that's ever been used, was mined from energy. So there was energy put into a computer. The computer did a coded calculation. And every 10 minutes, a certain amount of Bitcoin is released into the world for solving that proof of work problem. Now, I have Bitcoin and I can send it to you instantly. And that's the effectiveness that I can move digital energy over space. And the interesting thing about moving it over time is that because it's stored in a blockchain in a digital cryptographic signature, that Bitcoin can now be stored on this digital wallet to move over time. So effectively, what we're doing is that using energy as a way to make sure content is valuable inside of a digital network, not a made up thing like a like or a heart or a retweet or all these other things. We're using energy as a way to make sure content is actually real and valuable. And that's the interesting thing to think about, like the impacts of what is Bitcoin actually? It's energy. Yeah, I didn't know that definition of Bitcoin. I really thought that I always was thinking that it's something like tangible or something like digital or something that we have control. It's vi and if you, but if you think about the roots of it, it's, it's more tangible than anything that we've ever had. That's why like there's every other cryptocurrency and there's Bitcoin. Like when Ethereum went away from proof of work and is that proof of stake, which is just like, I have a lot of Ethereum, so I want to make sure that this is correct. You cannot fake energy. You cannot just make up more energy. Like today, I decided I want a thousand extra kilojoules. You can't just do that. There is actual work required in order to that. create that experience, in order to make sure that that Bitcoin is actually real. And now I can use this digital object to move energy, the most finite resource in our solar system. It's what drives everything that we do over space and time. Basically, the, as my understanding right now, if the Xeon works based on that and all that, I have a true community that every person is valued from their input and output. Of course. And there's a, there's a, there's a little micro GDP of energy in that That's experience. That's amazing. It is amazing. Like it is when amazing. I'm thinking about it, I say, you have this community that they are all real. And it's very meta too, because like, why aren't there bots on Zion? Well, in order for you to be a bot, you'd have to have Bitcoin. But bots only work on the internet because it's free. But you can't make up Satoshis. You can't just write a piece of code and put a thousand sats in somebody's wallet. Like if you open your wallet and say, I want a thousand Satoshis, and I pay you that invoice from my phone, I'm moving energy to your wallet quite literally. Wow. This is like, you're talking 20 years in the future, but, no. but it's, it's happening. That's what I'm saying. It's, I mean, the thing is, is that I think people have a misunderstanding of, of what Bitcoin is. Yes. I think that's the thing is like, oh, they think it's this like cryptocurrency. It's like, I can it's tell. This, it's this, it's, it is a bare instrument, right? It's a bare instrument that can move energy over space and time. To be honest with you, I was really not against the Bitcoin. I was like, didn't maybe understand it. And I was talking to my son about it, you know, and he's very into it. And now I have a kind of clear understanding of what is actually Bitcoin is. Now that's, that's amazing. Mm. Like I, I have a, like a clear thing. But how that's going to really help us to build our, our social ecosystem? Like how that's going to affect and change? Because it will. I, I, I think that what people are coming to an understanding of for the first time is that the banking system that runs this world 
printing is, money <laughs> is 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 quite a corrupt and slowly but surely destroying our society. Um, and understanding in particular how the Federal Reserve was created, what it was created for, how it does things, it makes you kind of flip everything that you understand about money and what the true value of money is and how do you store value into a system. What's really unfortunate, I think, about society nowadays is that if you are someone that's prudent in your life, and what I mean by prudent is that you save. You're somebody that wants to save and doesn't want to spend more than you make. You're actually hurt in today's society because the value of your money goes down every single year, eight to 10% because of inflation if you are a saver. A dollar last year is now only 80 cents. And the next year it's going to be 75. And in 100 years, you'll lose the entire value of that dollar. And so if you're a saver in our world today, it's, you're actually hurt by that. And I think there needs to be a way that someone that doesn't want to be an investor, that doesn't want to be someone that takes high risk of capital, that just wants to save, should be able to save. And they can't do that with dollars. And in which way they have to save? Like, you mean with the Bitcoin? I think it's, 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 it's one of our only options now to exit the system. Because you heard what's happening to dollar right now. Of course. We all know what's happening in the dollar right now. They're all these countries it's, are coming it's, together. It's, it's, it's printing. It's pr more. I mean, what is the stat? I think 50% of all the money ever created was created in the last four years. No. Really? We oh can my look God. that up. I mean, just Google it. So how much money? I mean, you guys can Google it on your <laughs> phone. How like, how like printing of money in the last four, like how much, how much money was printed? Maybe it's 41% to be wow. exact, but it's, I, I believe that that stat is correct. I mean, you could look it up, but it's. That's and if I'm wrong, I'll take the L on it. But I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty sure that that's a fact. And what's going to happen to all, like really, what's going to happen to our investment is right? What's going to happen to our lives if, if that's going to go and the dollar is going to go and what well, we're going to live based on what? I don't know that. I mean, this is what it's just people that are way smarter than me. But I think, by the way, like, We should start definitely start this podcast of like this is not investment advice. Yeah, exactly. I'm not an investment advice. Like this is not. I have no fucking idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. So let's make sure that's the baseline. <laughs> yeah, that's the baseline. Um, but like for me, I do believe. Was that right? Was that stat right? What is that? Eighty percent, not fifty percent. Eighty percent. We are doubled what we talk about. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. Wow. It's like pr money printer. Go burr. That's the, that's that, the that's, term. That's, that's the what meme. it is. You know, it's print. just print. It, like, and people are like, oh, you know, we don't know why inflation happens. Like, really? You don't know why inflation happens? You don't think that the printing of all this extra cash was the reason inflation is happening? That's what happened. They're, bre they're slowly breaking the economy. They're slowly breaking it. And you need to know how to get out. Do you think we're going to face another recession? We are in a recession. You are in <laughs> like, a lot of people. They don't feel yeah, it. They don't. You know, it's weird. I was, I was, kind of, I fly a lot, and I see all these people on vacations and traveling and doing all this stuff, and I'm like, do you understand what's about to happen? Like, do you understand that all these jobs are going away? Like, the days of flourishing and amazingness is is changing. We're entering a really challenging time, but you're spending money like it's no tomorrow. Like what, a, what are signs that you saw that you have seen that? I mean, look at the number of layoffs from the largest tech yeah. companies in the world. Um, most of these tech stocks are down 70, 80%. The market is kind of priced in the fact that we're going into a recession. Everything's costing more money. And the Federal Reserve does, know, does not know how to tame inflation at this point. It's very clear. They keep raising interest rates and raising interest rates and raising interest rates. I don't think they've raised it enough. I, didn't think, I don't think they've broken the system enough to make demand go down. The problem is demand is not going down. People are still spending ad libitum. They're like, okay, let's keep spending money when, they, when the risk-free rate is 4.8%. It's, it's a pretty weird time. Time. I think we're getting to a place where people are not really understanding how our system works. And they just think it's like the last cycle. It's the last cycle. This is very different than the last cycle. Like what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, you know? Yeah, that I mean, was, I, I, think it was, I think that was a misallocation of capital. But I think that's also a realization that like banks don't have all the money. This is a cool stat that I learned. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when you go put money in a bank... 
You know why they don't call it your funds on your digital report and they just say balance? No, because never... it's actually not your money anymore. It's just an IOU balance that they eventually have to pay you. So the language on the website or the language on your statement actually just says balance. Because it's the balance that at one point we probably owe you this money, but it's not actually your money anymore. Basically, they work with it. It's not your money anymore. It's an IOU. It's a, it's a balance on your account, but it's not your money anymore. How that makes sense? It doesn't make sense to me. You know? Yeah, it doesn't make sense to anybody. Like when you deposit your money. It's my money I'm depositing it to your bank. But it's no longer your money. You're an un... Un, what is it called? It's a un, uninsured depositor to the bank. Look, if I deposit $100,000 right now, cash, and I want to take it back in next three hours. Maybe you can. But I had a f- friend, they said they can't do it. Exactly. That's what I'm, th- this is a, the point I'm trying to say, that banks don't actually have all the money that people have put into them. And the concept of a bank run, which exactly what happened with Silicon happened? Valley Bank, was that they didn't have all the money that people gave them. Their liabilities outweighed their deposits. I heard that they only keep 10% of what you yeah, put Yeah, fractional in. reserve banking. They lend out the rest. Have you seen that? There's a, there's a cool video that like someone takes out $10 and I'm like, um, I owe you $20. Um, but I'm going <laughs> to give you ten dollars. But I'm giving you ten dollars now, and then you're like, okay, um, uh, you owe me, but you owe me twenty. You, then you give me the ten. It's like, okay, now I owe you ten. I'm like, oh, here I owe you ten. Here's the other ten that I owe you, and then comes back, gives me ten, and then somehow this ten dollars made us each now go balance back to zero. This is how the Federal Reserve banking system works. Wow. I think that then with what we discuss, I think the Bitcoin is going to be a solution. I mean, it is a potential opportunity into the system. Um, the question is, like, how much debt can we have? And this is above my pay grade. I don't know. It's just like my intuition tells me that there's something very wrong and people aren't aware of what's happening. You and know, there has and- to be a level of awareness. Like, we're living in an age where information is all over the place and we should all be informed about what's happening to our banking system. I had a friend that when I was talking and then I told him that you're going to join the show, he said... Would you please ask him that, what is lightning? And, you know, how that's going to play into all that stuff. It's a very complex... Yeah, li- like lightning is it's a layer very two... complex subject. No, it's, it's layer two Bitcoin. I mean, effectively, it's what makes Bitcoin... How they go together. Yeah, so basically, instead of um, having a wallet on chain, lightning takes a layer two and uses these things called lightning nodes and allows you to move money peer to peer without having the transactions um, confirmed on the blockchain. So it makes it instant, fast, quick, and cheap. Because Bitcoin main, main like layer one, is very slow, but very secure. And that's the point. Think of it as like, that's the vault. But if we want to move like pennies to each other, we don't have to have that extreme layer of security. And that's what Lightning does. Lightning allows us to move money at the speed of light. Kind of cool to see it like, this is Lightning. This is how Lightning moves money. That fast. Yeah, super fast. And what is the limitation? There's no limitation. I mean, right now, I think capacity of the Lightning network is like 5,000 Bitcoin. But it's going to, as more people use it, it's in the front pocket, I think. Uh, No, no, not that one, just the main one. But it's okay. If he doesn't have it, it's not a big deal. We can do it later. Um, But there's not too much limitations right now other than the total lightning capacity, but that increases over time. It's going up 20% every year. Which, that's every year 20%, that's high. Yeah. And basically, I'm, I'm just calculating in my head that in the future, I can, people, they can do a lot of investment or transaction through that. Of course. I, I think that's eventually where the safest it will, way to it, do it. It will be the, tr- the base layer transaction layer for the world. That's what we hope. That's what we hope. And what do you think that this is going to go in the next, with all this stuff concerned right now, with this all, you know, the recession, this technology, where are we going right now as you predict? What is your prediction? I think we're going through. We're, we're gonna is be it going to get better or worse? <laughs> I think it gets worse before it gets better because I think the system really needs to. And I hate to say it, like not break, but really put a lot of stress for people to be like, look, we need, we need to think of a better way to, to manage this. Like these old men and women deciding how the world should work 
is getting ridiculous. You have 70 and 80 year olds deciding how this world works and their minds are still in the 1960s and 1970s. You saw that interview for the TikTok CEO that one of the Congress people, they were asking him something and about the Wi-Fi or I don't, I don't remember exactly what that and they didn't know what they're talking about. And the guy, the CEO of you know, TikTok was just, what? Of course, they're using Wi-Fi yeah. to connect. It's yeah, that I, bad. Yeah, I, I think that they're just, they're an old guard that needs to just kind of go away and let, let, like, let some new blood that like wants to build in the world that they want to live in. Like, I think, I think it's our responsibility. I talked to a lot of my friends about this is that, you know, once these people go through their life, um, in 20 years, my friends and I are going to be in our fifties. We're probably going to be running either the biggest companies in the world. We're going to be part of the governments. We're going to be probably running the NASDAQ. And this is like this group of friends that I know very well. And that's just kind of what's probably going to happen. And the question we ask is like, what kind of world do we want to live in? And I know for a fact, it's not this. I know for a fact that it's not this kind of deceitful, the way things work. It's just, that's not the world that we want to live in. What kind of world do you imagine? I think a world that's beautiful, transparent, um, one that, we're not so decisive with each other. I think like if you look at like even the concepts of war, like we go to war and we forget that these are like two human beings. But ultimately, like if you like really look someone in the eye and like truly just like send a minute with them, like no human would ever want to really hurt another human. It doesn't like it. There's no there. There is some very dark things that happen in the world. But truly, like humans are made to just like love each other. Yeah, I, I think like I think like levels of love have kind of gone. Yeah, I, 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 I strongly believe to what you said because at the end we are all humans, and you know, and we all the same. It doesn't matter what language I'm immigrant, you know. Yeah, Iranian, and some of it, some, you know, some you're of half, it, you know. Yeah. I'm an Iranian American immigrant, came here, worked my butt off, washed dishes, everything else, and now this is a home for thirty years. But and served in Iran Iraq War. Yeah. Yeah, it was a war that mm-hmm. happened, but I still carry it that what we did that for. Yeah. I don't get it. You know, Afghanistan, Iraq. Most all. people don't, don't understand why we do certain things. I, I swear to God, it's, it's still just, it's so vague. And I said, what, what is happening? This is really how we're going to raise our kids? Yeah. Or this is going to be the definition of freedom? Yeah. How we want to explain that what is a freedom? And I don't think so. We're going to have 100% freedom be honest with you, with any technology, anything, I think the government is going to have something in it or what is it, I don't know. But it's not going to be a 100% as you define freedom, we're going to have that. Sure. It's going to be very hard. Yeah, utopia doesn't work. I'm not, by the way, I'm not implying that I think utopia is the way to go. I actually don't no. know if that's the answer. But where, where, where Zeon is going? What is the future for Zeon? Where do you I, see Zeon in like two years, think, five years? Oh, man. I, I think that what, what's really you important... cranking it, I know. What's, what, what's really important for people to understand is that Zion is a Zion. proof of concept of an application using identity, money, and messaging. And it's just the first app example of... With this framework, this technology that I started to describe, what else can you build? So I think what you'll see over the next 24 months is that there will be many applications built on top of what we've created. Okay, I got you. And this opens up a whole world of possibilities of what you can create on top of a decentralized monetary layer. Zion is just an example of what we're building, but it's not the end goal. Okay, I, I, now I get it because th- my, I got it now because Zion... It's going to be the foundation of the future technology that protect not only your privacy, but make everything more sense and decentralized. It's Zion, going to be a foundation. Is that right? Zion is the foundation of how you build a digital democracy. Love that. I want to quote you on that. <laughs> that's, you. That's, that's the digital democracy. Folks, Listen to that. Digital democracy. That was the best. Mm. I love that. Digital democracy. Mm. That's well said. That really goes with what you guys are trying to do. Yeah. And then we can build all those applications on top of that with no headaches or fear. 
mm. you know, because you build the application. If it gets there, then government is going to put the finger on it. Yeah. But my question for you is that, do you not like, go by government rules and policies if you build anything? Totally I, I, we do. We follow all the laws in the U.S. Of course we do. We follow every law that's there. I'm like, I'm not, nothing we're doing is illegal and I will never do anything that's illegal. But if illegal. they come to you and say, Justin, I want you to release the data. Or this, there is the, no well, data. This, this is the problem is with this act. It, it puts me in a very uncomfortable position and it puts me in like kind of a, a vulnerable position. And of course, I'm not like, the goal, the end goal, if I'm looking at the end state of what this thing is, is that if I'm testifying in front of Congress and I'm telling them what's going on with like now Zion's infrastructure is used across thousands of applications yes. and they say, hey, we need this information. I'm like, listen, it's not about that I don't want to give it to you. It's that I just can't. And I'm sorry. And you really can't. I mean, I would tell you, the truth. Because you build it in a way that you actually can. Yeah, the, like, I, I, think, I think every human has an ability to be coerced no matter what you say. There's, like, there's a 100% level of coercion that a human will, like, nothing is truly, truly, truly private. So you have to build a system that's coercion resistant more than anything. And that's what I'm attempting to do. Will I be successful at it? I have no idea. But at least I'm going to like give it a try. And like, I, I, I want to work on really hard problems. That's kind of what my... It, it's been working so far, I think. Yeah, I mean, thousands of people use it every day. Ten, That's what I'm saying. 10,000 people, 10,000 transactions have moved in the first 30 days. Like people are doing something on it. I know that it's, yeah, it's like, working. It works. <laughs> now it's a matter of how this, this is going to scale. How is going to be the, the, the new ecosystem? Totally, 100%. And because I believe with what you're telling me and explain everything to me. I think this is going to be a new ecosystem. Yeah, I hope so. But I definitely, after this, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to get on it, put the community on it and use it because if you have a solid, true fans out there. Yeah. That the physical. A thousand. That's and all you, you need. And you do that and then that's golden. Yeah, you just need a thousand. You don't need a lot of people. Like you need a thousand true fans, like a real, like a real thing. And like, that's what we're, we're trying to be. We're trying to be that like place for, you know, true, true fans. And, and how we, the influence and creator using it or how they, you know, yeah. talk about it or they getting involved. Or yeah, well, I mean, some, some, of, some of the creators on the app right now just are investors and they're creating their communities on there because they want a destination that they own. Because the important thing is like, you know, this video is going to go out on YouTube and Instagram yeah. and Facebook and TikTok and Twitter or whatever. But like, you don't own any of that. Like, you don't own the distribution Right. So the question I was always asking myself is like what Zion some like it is also at the base layer right now is that it's a it's your publishing platform and your bank in one single experience. Because it gives you the distribution and also gives you the monetization and it's the end state of the monetization because it's Bitcoin. Wow. And does Tony Robbins using it? Uh, Tony has an account. There's a Tony Robbins account. On there. <laughs> yeah, Tony has a, an account on the app. How, how did you get with? Uh, how did you get with? How he got involved with you? Tony was um, got involved. One of our early creators on the app, JP Sears, uh, which lives here in Austin, um, knew Tony, and knew Tony. He, he knew Tony. He said, "Hey, I'm working on this project. Do you want to have a call with us?" And I was, it was summer of 2001, 2021. And I was in my living room and I just talked to him. I was like, hey, this is what I'm building. This is how it works. Um, would you like, you know, he's like, how can I help? I was like, I'd love to, for you to be involved. And he was my first investor. He wrote the first check. He's an amazing guy. He's incredible. Incredible. He's you know, powerful I'm powerful man to have in your corner. You know, powerful. One, of, one of my goals is to sit down and talk to him. And this is because I learned English through him. Mm. And when I came here like years ago, it wasn't any like a audio bowl or all that stuff. We had these cassettes. Yeah, anyway, I had a Mazda Portuguese in 1993. And then I, I bought his destiny. I bought his cassette. It was like 12, 14. And I was playing that and I mm. wouldn't understand 80% of it. Mm. And then I said, I'm going to keep listening to it, 
listen to it, I think it goes to my brain and my brain start recognizing it because I was working in a restaurant and all that stuff, dishwasher. And I got it. I was listening to it. And one day I was driving one of the, you know, tape. He said, pull over now. And I still have it. And I, I said, what the heck? And I pulled over. And I pulled over. He said, okay, now you got a thing. You know, motions comes from emotion. Mm. The way you breathe, the way you walk is going to create that. I never forget that. And he says, if you have a bad day, you got to get yourself. I'm still like going through that. I'm still, you know, Tony Ramos mastery and all that stuff. But it's an amazing person. It's an amazing yeah. person. So I owe him a lot because of that, because I never give up and I was keep going that. But I heard a lot of good things and I'm, and he's a smart, I'm sure. And he yeah. loves, uh, freedom of people he loves people he loves to be part of something big i think yeah and he's he's one of the most important people of our generation i think how many like how many employees you have in the zeon right now um know. we have about 10 people working lean, on the project mean lean mean fighting machine i like yeah. I, I like like right now we're i like to call is like we're trying to find product market fit and we're this like hot chili pepper. Like we're small, but we're very fiery because we're everywhere. Our impact is all over the place. And we have thousands of people using the service and um, we want to get that to millions very quickly. Um, and I don't like, I'm not a believer that you have to like go and hire so many folks to do it. Like you can build an efficient team and like, you know, like you only need a few people to like take over the world. You don't need teams. I love there. that. That's what we have a philosophy in, in military. They said you need a, 12 people in Navy SEAL rather than infantry. Yeah. You know, that's what it's saying. You can do a lot. Yeah, you can do a lot. You can do a lot. Yeah. And that, that's a good philosophy because definitely you guys, you have and you, you have and the, the technology and you've been working so hard on it. And mm. this is really, you know, as I finished that book and, you know, it's really, I tell everybody you should read that book because I didn't know anything. <laughs> Mm. And I learned so much from it. Thank you, know? you man. Thank it's, you so much. Thank it, you for the support. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I spread the word all the time. I said, guys, today I told my guys, I said, you guys, they all have a copy of it and they mm. read it. And I said, guys, you should read it because this is where we're going. Mm. Like after you explain that the, the community of the Xeon and how I can put my community in it because I'm getting, I'm a creator. I'm, in, mm. you know, not call myself insu- influencer, but I'm a creator. I love people, talking to people, mm. learn a lot. I think that, will help not only me, there's mm. a lot of people too. Sure. And is that, but I have one question for you. Do you think it's a good time to start a business? As an entrepreneur that you see everything, especially these people that come to Austin right now, they got to start a startup technology. Is it scary? I think the question before you ask yourself, is it a good time? The question should be why? Why are you deciding to do something? Like what's the, what's the why behind it? Because it's crazy to start a business. Like if you think about it, the amount of hours, the amount of things you have no guarantee, like logically speaking, it's a very bad idea. Like just thinking of pure logic. So the only thing that should ever drive you is your why is like, what's the ultimate reason you're doing this? Is it because of money? Is it because of getting out of this? Is getting that? And if you have your why very clear, then maybe you have an answer, but it's not about should you, it's what's your why. You're not driven by money. Why? What? You're not driven by money. I am. I am somewhat driven by money. No, you're I'm driven not. by money for it, but you're not like a. I'm just gonna do this for money. Yeah, I don't think that's very short term. I think that it's very. It's a short term. Like, look, I made money when I was young, and like, if I'm 10x my net worth, like, not a lot's gonna change for me, right? Like, what what what's gonna change? Like a bigger house, you can't really get a nicer car. What a bigger airplane! Like what? Like what? What's gonna do? bigger boat? Like, yeah. you're like more? Like not any more friends? You can't have more friends, really. Like what's gonna change? Like not a lot. Not a lot in my life. So, the question is: Is did you leave this place doing that thing of impact? And for me, it's fully about global impact. Is, fully, that, it's your, about, is that your why? Now it is. No, is it it is. Your yeah, why? I mean, I wrote a book called yeah. Unapologetic Freedom. Like, it's like <laughs> totally that's that my title life. is amazing. Yeah, like it's like I've, like that is now is that I believe I have a particular set of skills that allows me to see things in the future today and have 
the resources to build something. So it would be a waste of my existence on this planet if I didn't put all my heart and effort to do that thing or give it my best. Do you have any regrets? No. Are you serious? So it's all experiences. No. I love that. There's not like what, what uh, uh, like there's not in, in my, do I regret that I could have been nicer in this situation, that I could have been a better? Yes, of course. Do I regret not being an asshole sometimes to people? Obviously. But it's the things that I learned along the way that allowed me to advance to where I am today in my career. Life is happening for you at all times. I love that. The way you're looking at it, I love that because nobody's perfect. You know, no, we've all been there. We're, 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 no, no, we're perfectly imperfect. We're perfectly imperfect. I learned so much from you today, man. I'm going to use all that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. Do you have any message for the people out there? No, I, 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 we, we went through a lot. You went through a we lot. We went through a lot. So um, but. not, 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 a, I mean, look, if, if I share videos on the internet all the time. I know. I love your guy, videos. If you, if you found this valuable, just follow me on the internet, I guess. Yeah. Like kinda, kinda, just like search down, Justin Rizvani. You will see everything. <laughs> download, download Zion. Zion.fyi yeah. is the website and play around with it. Give me your feedback. See if, um, if this thing matters to you. It's a great your, things you guys. Your support do. matters. So thank you. You guys are doing a great things, and I appreciate your time and being here. I know you just got back from the trip like yesterday or Sunday, and then you are here. That means a lot to me, man. Yeah, of course, I, man. I, I'm happy I, to do this. I'm, really happy, I'm happy we made it happen. So yeah, thank you yeah, for your time. I love that. I love that. But mm -hmm. I hope everything goes well, and we're going to see you changing the world. Appreciate that, brother. Thank Thanks you so much. Me.